Hello and welcome to our Communion 101 class. I'm glad you're able to join us and learn about Holy Communion. You'll need two things for this class. The first is you will need your Bible. Here's my Bible here. You can use whichever version you have at home. That'll be fine. And the second thing you will need is this workbook which you should have received in the mail. This, it says Fed and Forgiven and Communion Workbook on the bottom. And I guess you'll need a pen or a pencil too. So three things that you'll need for our class today. So Communion really begins with a story. And the story comes from the Bible and it's a story that we actually hear every time we gather for worship. And I want to share with you a picture I have of this story. This is a picture of Jesus meeting with his disciples for a special meal. And I want you to open up your Bibles now to Matthew, the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, and start with verse 17. I want you to read along with me, okay? So we're looking at Matthew chapter 26, verse 17, and we're gonna go all the way through 30. Let's read together. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him, one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to one whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take eat this is my body then he took a cup and after giving thanks he gave it to them drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins i tell you i will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when i drink of it new with you in my father's kingdom so you will see now in this picture Here's Jesus in the center, and here's his disciples gathered around him. And here in this basket was going the, bre the bread, and here's a chalice for wine. And here in this corner, you can see one of the disciples is turned away from the group. And I think this is Judas, who we hear in that story is the one who is going to betray Jesus. So Holy Communion starts with a meal, and it's that meal there, that story of Jesus meeting with his disciples for that last time to have that last supper. And it's there that he shares with them the breaking of the bread and the passing of the cup. And he says, do this and remember me. This is my body. This is my blood. And I give them for you. Okay, so... You will notice that also in the beginning of that story, they talked about how Jesus and his disciples were meeting for a special meal called Passover. And I want you to turn now in your workbook to pages 14 and 15. They look like this. And on one page you will see it says Passover. And then on the other it says Holy Communion. And I would like for us to go through these together. So over here we have in the purple circle, the Passover meal involved the death of a lamb. Over here we have 
Holy Communion involves the death of Jesus, the Lamb of God. The Passover involved blood. The Last Supper, Jesus referred to the wine as the new covenant in my blood. Jesus commanded Israel to eat the Passover meal every year. Jesus commanded us to take and eat and to do this. When celebrating Passover, Jewish people eat specific foods. When celebrating Holy Communion, Christians use specific foods. When celebrating Passover, Jewish people retell the story of God, freeing them from slavery in Egypt. When celebrating Holy Communion, Christians retell the story of Jesus by repeating his promise. The Passover meal is a way for Jewish people to remember what God has done for Israel. Holy Communion is a way for Christians to remember that God gives us the gifts of grace and new life. So the Passover meal is connected to that story of how God led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and freed them to lead them ultimately to the promised land. And that's the story that they tell when they meet for Passover every year. Now, we know that Jesus and his disciples were meeting for Passover, but then Jesus transformed that meal into something new. He transformed it into Holy Communion for you and for me. Next, I want you to turn in your booklet here, your workbook, to pages six and seven. As you can see here, I have sticky notes over my answers. I'm gonna invite you to put your own answers in those boxes in just a moment. So we talk about Holy Communion being a sacrament. What does that mean? What is a sacrament of the church? Okay, so this is the sacrament scene investigation. A sacrament has three parts. It's got to be, to be some, for something to be considered a sacrament, it's got to have these three parts. First, it's something Jesus commanded us to do. Second, it uses a physical element, something we can see, touch, and sometimes taste. And third, it gives us God's grace, love, and forgiveness. I want you to turn back in your Bibles to that Matthew 26 that we just read from, that Matthew 26, 17 through 29 and go through that story and see if you can find a place where Jesus tells us to do something, where he uses physical elements, something we can see, touch, and sometimes taste. And third, it gives us God's grace, love, and forgiveness. Okay, so I want you to pause the video right now, and I want you to go to your Bible and see if you can fill in these three areas with these three answers. Okay, go ahead and pause. Okay, I hope you were able to find the answers. In this Bible story, we hear that Jesus tells us, eat, drink, do this in remembrance of me. Those are three commandments that Jesus tells us to do. Eat the bread, drink the wine, and do this in remembrance of him. It uses bread and wine, something we can see, taste, and touch. And in this story, we also hear about how this is a meal that we will share with Jesus in heaven. So that is a promise of grace's love, God's grace, love, forgiveness, and grace. So we are given the promise of eternal life. So with those three circles filled in, we understand then that Holy Communion does meet the requirements to be considered a sacrament in our church. Ten bonus points go to anyone who can tell me what the other sacrament in the Lutheran Church is. And it is, that's right, Holy Baptism. We have two sacraments in the Lutheran Church, Holy Baptism and Holy Communion. Alrighty, so next... I want to take us on a little field trip. We are going to go over here, and I have an activity set up for us. All right. You'll see here on this table that I have three baskets that are covered. And in those baskets, I have an item of food. Now, based on the ingredients listed in those 
in those foods, I want you to try to guess what foods those are, okay? All right, first food. The ingredients are these. Pasteurized part skim milk, cultures, salt, and enzymes. Okay, what food do you think has skim milk, cultures, salt, and enzymes? Just those four things. What do you think that might be? All right, I'm gonna show it to you. Are you ready? It is string cheese. Yay! Okay, this next one's a little bit more tricky. All right, I'm gonna read to you the ingredient list. All right, ready? Corn syrup, sugar, modified corn starch, pear juice concentrate, apple juice concentrate, strawberry puree, carrot juice concentrate, and it contains 2% or less of citric acid, vitamin C, fruit pectin, sodium citrate, malic acid, dextrose, sunflower oil, vegetable and fruit juice added for color, natural flavor, flavor and carnauba wax. So what do you think that is? It's got a lot of sugar and fruit juice and a whole bunch of other stuff. So fruit juice, sugar, oil, some acids, wax, any ideas? All right, are you ready? It is fruit snacks. Okay, third and last one. The ingredients are milk chocolate, which contains, which itself is made of sugar, chocolate, cocoa butter, skim milk, lactose milk, soy lecithin, not sure if I'm saying that right, sugar, corn syrup, hydrogenated palm kernel oil, and less than 2% of cocoa powder processed with alkali, salt, egg whites, artificial, and natural flavors. So that one, I think you might be able to guess, it's something to do with chocolate, right? Okay, it is the ingredients for a Three Musketeers bar. Awesome. Okay, so why do I show you all of that? Well, my point is, is that even though the ingredient list tells us that, say, for example, that a string cheese has salt in it. So we know by reading the ingredient list that string cheese has salt in it, right? And we trust that there's salt in it and we can taste that there's salt in it, but we can't see the salt, right? When you look at that string cheese, you can't see the salt. So we also think about Jesus in the communion bread in a similar way. We can't see Jesus in the communion bread. We can't find on even on a molecular level, even if we were to take communion bread and put it under a microscope, we couldn't see little bitty bitty parts of Jesus in the communion bread. So how does Jesus get in there? We understand that Jesus gives us this bread and this wine and that he is present in this meal. So we take this as a matter of faith. You and I trust because Jesus gives us the promise that he is present in the bread and wine, that he is truly present. So his promise is what we trust, that Jesus is present, even if there's not any bitty little microscopic Jesus in there, just like with the, the string cheese. We trust the ingredient label that promises us that salt is in there, even if we can't see it. Okay, next. I'm gonna go on another little field trip, and we're gonna to go to our altar at church. Okay, so the altar is basically a big table. What do you see on this table that you might have on your dining table at home? You might have candles. There's our candle. You might have a tablecloth. You might have cups. We have a fancy word for these cups. These are called chalices. You might have other serving ware. This is a bowl. And the fancy word for the bowl is patent. And we also have food on our table, right? 
Now, just like your meal at home, there are certain manners around eating at the table, right? So we receive Holy Communion by way of dipping the bread into the wine in one of the cups, right? So that is something that we do uh, with respect. It's because we understand Jesus is fully present in this meal. We do this with respect in our hearts and in our bodies. So when we come up for communion, we don't pop it into our mouths. Like we don't throw it up in the air and catch it in our mouth. We don't take chewing gum out of our mouth first and then pop the, the communion wafer in. We are talking with our friends behind us in line to receive communion. We come forward to receive this meal of grace with, with hearts that are reflecting on this amazing promise of God's grace and love. Okay, so there are a lot of different ways to receive communion. And if you visit other churches, you will find that different churches have different practices. They might have big cups like we do, and they might have everyone drink out of them rather than dipping their bread in. They might have wafers like we do sometimes, or they might have real bread like we usually do. And, or they might have little itty little bit of, bitty little cups and, and everyone gets their own little cup to receive the wine. All are okay. So they're just, they're just different practices in different churches. Okay, so your homework from here is to do two things for me. The first is I want you to talk with your parents about what you have learned today about how Holy Communion comes from the story of Jesus meeting with his last, with his disciples for the, the Last Supper. And then that meal was actually a Passover meal. And Jesus transforms that meal and gives that story new meaning for us. And you can even show them the page in your workbook about the similarities between the two stories. You can talk to them about you can talk with them about how you understand that Jesus is really present in the bread and wine, even if we can't see a microscopic, itty-bitty little Jesus. But we trust because of Jesus' promise that Jesus is present in this meal, and this meal gives us grace and love. You can also share with them about how we do believe that Holy Communion is a sacrament, and even talk about the three requirements for something to be considered a sacrament that Jesus commands us to do it, that it includes something we can see, touch, taste, or smell, and that it gives us God's grace and love. And then finally, I want you to talk with your, with your parent about whether or not they would like you to commune by receiving wine or grape juice, okay? And I want you to also talk with them about what Holy Communion means to them. What are they thinking about when they come up to receive communion? Did they say something in response? Some people say, amen. Some people say, thanks be to God. Some people cross themselves with the sign of the cross. What do they do and what are they thinking about? Okay, so that's your homework that you, you need to do. And some home fun for you to do, if you would like to do it, is to bake communion bread together. You'll see in your workbook on page 20 that there is a recipe for baking communion bread together. So that's just a fun activity to do together as a family. All right, peace be with you and thank you for joining me today.